God says to the wicked, thou shalt surely die, what's going to happen to the wicked is that he's surely going to die, period. And there's no good person who rejects Jesus. There's no rebel that says, you know what, I don't need Jesus because I'm a better person than any Christian in your church. My friend, the wicked, will surely die, and you and I cannot possibly ever be correct in passing judgment on holy God and thinking that he would not be just in judging the wicked for his unrighteousness. The wicked will surely die. Don't be mistaken about it. Many times you and I will run into a person We'll have to look at our lives and we'll have to look at theirs and we'll say, well, you know, when it comes to being good people, they're probably a better people than I am. The fact of the matter is they may be a much better person than you are and than I am, but God says that the individual who is trusting in his own righteousness is doing so so that he can ignore the righteousness of Jesus Christ and so that he can reject the shed blood of the cross of Calvary in lieu of his own righteousness, and that's the most wicked sin anyone could ever possibly commit. You ought to warn that person of his wickedness. You ought to tell him that your righteousness, my friend, is as filthy rags, and you'll burn in hell, and I'm warning you that it's a fact, and God says so, and if God says so, you will surely die. You know what Satan said? Thou shalt not surely die. He was wrong. He was wrong. You ought to preach hell, and you ought to tell about how wrong Satan is. Tell somebody the truth about impending danger. And the impending danger of every person who is on the broad path that leads to destruction is that they will burn in hell for the rest of their eternal living, which will never end, and they'll never die. The fire won't be quenched, the worm won't die, and they'll be miserable for millions of years, compounded upon millions into eternity, which means no end. And friend, that's something to warn people about. Preach hell. Preach hell to the lost. They may not like it, but they'll know about it. You know, uh, many people don't even have a concept of hell. I'm amazed at how many people go around using the word in their swearing and so forth, but they really, in their mind, don't even have an actual concept of what hell is. So much so that Christians throw around the word hell in reference to their lives that they live. And I'll tell you something, if someone doesn't understand hell, uh, it, it's easily demonstrated by the fact that someone would refer to life on this earth as hell. You have no idea, my friend, if you think that this life, anything in this life could be hell, I don't care, the worst torture you could possibly go through will be nothing in comparison to being in a fire that burns every uh, speck of your body and never being consumed by it. And those individuals, whether we warn them or not, who reject Jesus Christ, will burn in hell and a good watchman will say, look out for hell. Look out for hell. By the way, that's why you teach hell. That's why you preach hell. You don't preach hell to be mean. You're going to hell and you're going to burn. I'm glad. No, sir. You're, you're going to hell unless you turn to Jesus Christ. And that's why we warn the wicked so that they can turn. And if they don't turn, they'll surely burn. But the fact is that it's not about the burning that we're warning them. We're warning them so that they don't burn. What does it mean when the Bible says that His blood will be required at your hands? Well, you'll be accountable for it. You'll be accountable for it. And you and I stand before the Lord if we're not good stewards as watchmen for the lost souls of men whom God has called us to preach the message to. Those individuals are the ones we're surrounded by in case you're concerned or wondering whether you know who you'll be accountable for. It's just everybody you know. And so that's who you'll be accountable for. And if we stand before the Lord and we have not done justice to those individuals, then their blood will be required at our hands. How will their blood be required at our hands? We won't die in their place. No, my friend, we'll stand before the Lord empty-handed, and our empty hands will be uh, literally, figuratively, I guess you could say, covered in blood of those souls whom we should have warned, who may have turned from their wicked way, who may not have turned from their wicked way. Oh, pastor, do you mean that people might go to hell because I don't preach the gospel to them? Well, it looks like the Bible says so. And so um, I think we ought to preach the gospel with a little more urgency than to just believe that God appoints people to go to heaven. And so our being a good watchman or a lousy one doesn't matter at all just because God's going to force someone into heaven or force someone into hell because they don't have a free will. Friend, let me get this straight to you from the Bible so you understand it. God in heaven is sovereign, and in His sovereignty, He gives you the free will to be a good or a lousy watchman, and He gives men the free will to accept or to reject Jesus, and it's important for the way we live. 
Too many times we think, well, it's all a matter of opinion. Pastor, you just think that gospel preaching stuff is all the church is about. You're absolutely right. You know where I found that at? I found it in the Bible. God cares about souls. He wants us to preach the gospel to the lost. He wants people to turn from it. And if you don't preach the gospel, I believe men will go to hell. And I found that in the Bible. So I don't know if you like it or not, but there it is. You tell me what it means if it doesn't mean what it says. And then verse 19, the Bible says, He had a foul warrant of the wicked, and he turned not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way. He shall die in his iniquity. How is he going to die? In his iniquity. You know what that means? It means with his own unrighteousness and without the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But thou hast delivered thy soul. So you preach the gospel, and your hands will be clean. You know, there's a relief in giving the gospel. I, I talk to people a lot, and I, I really realize this more and more. And the more, I, the more I do soul winning, the more I realize how good it is for you to do soul winning. It really is. You know, one of the benefits of soul winning is clean hands. Clean hands. Clean hands is another way of saying clean conscience. And if you are struggling with something or you're having trouble getting victory in your life, you're having a hard time, I would suggest to you as a solution for your sin or as a solution to your unhappiness or your unsettledness in your heart, get out and preach the gospel and you'll be amazed at what it'll do to clean up your conscience. You'll be amazed at how it'll clear your mind. You'll be amazed at how it'll give you a new perspective and you'll be able to trust the Lord for matters and you'll be able to see that God's in control. And you run, you preach the gospel and whether men receive it or not, you get clean hands. And that's the benefit of preaching the gospel, clean hands. So go out and clean your hands once a day. It'll, be, it'll do you good. It really will. And you'll find out that you're guiltless. You just, and you know it. You say, Pastor, this just sounds so much like a burden and so much like works. Friend, preaching the gospel is the burden of the Lord. And there is a burden to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know how to get that burden off? Go out and do the work and your burden will be lifted. But there is a burden. You ought to be burdened for the loss. I'll bother you that people are going to burn in hell for eternity. I ought to just make you uneasy. And I'll make you wake up in the middle of the night and think, I ought to do something. Somebody ought to do something. I ought to be the one, and there ought to be something more I could do, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and the burden will do that to you. But when you obey the Lord, and you go out and be a faithful watchman, you'll find the burden to be lifted. And boy, what a wonderful way to live. And you'll have a clean conscience, you'll have clean hands, and, it, and nothing else will matter to you. And you just put everything in life in perspective. If you have some things right now that are just eating up your time, and they're eating up your mind, they're just taking you, just you know, the focus of your thoughts, and it just seems as though you just... You've just got this thing and you just can't do anything else until you get it out. Go out and be a watchman. You'll find you'll just clean up and God will make it disappear for you. That's a fact, right? I'm speaking from my own personal experience and I'm telling you the Word of God is true in this matter of clean hands. You say, Pastor, I don't really care whether my hands are clean or not. Well, um, I'm warning you. I'm warning you. It's a big deal. It's a great danger. And you ought to see yourself in the role of a watchman. And you ought to know that if you don't turn about your attitude of your service toward the Lord and you don't see yourself in that biblical sense that there's, there's a good chance that God will set a stumbling block in your way and it'll kill you. If you don't want to serve the Lord, what do you want to be on this earth for? What do you want to do instead? You won't succeed at it. If you do, you'll be miserable. And the only thing that will happen is you'll die in sin. And that wouldn't be worth anything at all. It's a noble calling to be a watchman. It's not a safe calling. It's not always a widely received calling. There's a lot of joy in it, though. And there's something about being called to a high place of service. That a person who doesn't believe does so by faith. It takes faith not to believe, just as much as it takes faith to believe. Or it's not believing in Jesus. You've got to have an alternative, something that you choose to believe. And the Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 2 says, teaches very plainly, that a, every person in the world needs to be saved and that the difference between people who get saved and people who do not get saved is unbelief. In other words, what do they do with Jesus? The object is Jesus and the thing that makes a difference between somebody who is damned to hell and judged by holy God and the person who is delivered from judgment and has the righteousness of God and of Christ is the matter of faith. It's a matter of belief or unbelief. Pastor, the problem with faith is that either you got it or you ain't, right? The Bible just teaches that that's not so. First of all, Romans chapter 1 teaches that every person who's ever born knows that there's a God. And you did too, if you'll think back. I, this is an interesting conversation that I've had with 
individuals that claim that they don't believe there's a God. And you know, a question I've started to ask them is, when did you stop believing there was God? When did you stop believing there was God? And you know, I was uh, in conversation with an atheist not very long ago who was talking about their children, how they'd been teaching their children that there was no God. And you know that atheists have to teach their children there's no God to get them to believe that because their children actually are born knowing there's a God. And you don't believe that, just think back yourself. You knew there was a God when you were a child. You did. You knew you were eternal. Uh, you knew that, there, that God existed. If you stopped believing in God, there was a certain time in your life when you made a choice of unbelief. You said, based on this and this and this, and usually it was a matter of you didn't like God. Usually it was a matter of, well, you know, that kind of God. You ever heard somebody say that? Your God or that kind of God. If God is good, then why does he allow sin? Friend, God doesn't allow sin. God doesn't make sinners. God judges sin. And by the way, all sin gets judged. You know where sin gets judged? You say, another thing that, that I found that individuals who don't want to believe in God, they have a real problem with Christians. And I don't blame them for it either because some Christians are really rotten people. And many times, especially before they're saved, one of the problems they have is, how come God would forgive that person? Isn't that true? Everybody says somebody doesn't like God because of the people that he saved. And, so, and I just want to remind you, God only saves lousy people doesn't save good people. And that's the kind of person he saved when he saved Ryan Price. I got saved at a young age and had the opportunity in my life. I shouldn't say opportunity. Everybody has the opportunity to do wrong. But I didn't have the, the track record of having built up a lot of things that uh, were, in, in our minds, terrible sin. But I was wicked when I was a child. My parents didn't have to sit down and teach me to lie. I was a born, natural, good liar. Um, I, was, uh, I was a little thief when I was a three- and four-year-old. Now, it's just a wicked little kid, and people think it's cute. Sin's not cute. Even when it's a little kid that commits it, we can laugh at it. But the fact is, is that it, it made me the enemy of God, and God judged that sin in the person of Jesus. And the difference between somebody who gets saved and somebody who doesn't is what they do with their knowledge of God. So uh, I was talking about how that, a, a person who pretends to be a person who doesn't believe that there's a God would ask the question, who, um, or, you know, their, their argument would be, hey, if God's good, you know, then why is there sin? And then the opposite side of that question, um, if God's good, then why doesn't he judge sin? Isn't that true? Most people that hate God are mad at God because of something terrible somebody did. Isn't it true? And usually somebody that's a Christian, somebody that says they believe in God. By the way, not everybody says they're a Christian, yes. Not everybody that says that they're a follower of God. Listen, they don't follow this book. And they believe that salvation is something other than the Bible teaches, they're not saved. You either save God's way or not saved at all. And so not every person that says, even the Bible says, not every person professing Lord, Lord. And it's true. And so the answer to that is simply this. First of all, doesn't, just because they say that's what they are, and, just, and many times there are individuals in the name of religion, in the name of Christ, that commit terrible, atrocious, wicked sin. And I'll just tell you something. God's not okay with it. And he'll judge it. So your argument about God's not good because some person is wicked and God hasn't judged them, um, every knee is going to bow. And every sin, every sin is going to be either paid for in the blood of Jesus Christ or will damn the person to hell for eternity. And if that's not judgment, I don't know what is. And if Jesus uh, didn't have the right to die for our sins and if God didn't have the right to forgive sin because of Jesus, I don't know what reasonably could be a way for us to be reconciled to God. How could a person... Uh, how could you ever accuse God of not being good when Christ died for your sin? God loves you, my friend, so much that he gave Jesus, uh, that he gave his son who would never sin as a substitute for you. And as good as you think you are, I'm telling you something. You and I, neither of us compares to Jesus. And God substituted the righteousness of Jesus for our sin. And so God's good. All right. I spent more time on that than, than uh, I intended to. But if you don't have that, if you don't lay the background for salvation, you can't teach it. The book of Romans talks about our salvation. Chapters 1 and 2 says, what about, um, what about people that don't know? All right, the Bible teaches in chapter 1, first of all, uh, in verse, uh, oh boy, verse 20, verse 20, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And I talked about how that every child is born in their heart knowing there's a God, and even know that he's a great God. I mean, it's not, he's not a God of the corn, or a God 
Uh, that's your fault, Keith. That that song about Pila Chaff. Are you part of that? Off the corn. Yeah. Okay. So he's not the. There are gods, by the way, of corn. Corn harvest. And corn's been on my mind all week long because of you. Anyway, that's an insider. So you'll have to. Um, then um, now I'm really sidetracked. Uh, it, there there are gods of of the water. There are gods of the moon. Gods of the sun. You know, a kid that's born doesn't have a god. You know, that is the God of whatever. It's the God of the world. It's the creator God, the one who created the universe. And the Bible teaches that by nature, we're born knowing that there's a God, and even the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, a, a, a supreme God, an eternal God. So he's not a little God. He's not a God that's, you know, got this good power, maybe this God that's got this evil power that needs to be appeased. He's the God of all living, and he's the God of all the people that make all the fake gods. And then Romans chapter... 21 says that the people who don't believe in God, this is their description. By the way, if you say, I don't believe in God, here's you. Uh, verse 21, because that when they knew God, you're born knowing there's a God. That's you. Nature shows you that there's a God. When they knew God, the Bible says they glorified him not as God. What does glorify mean? Glory means, glorify means to give a lifted up high place. If you want to just summarize it in a simplified way. In other words, what you said is God, you're not you're not greater than I am. And this really is the beef that most people have with God. They either think God's evil because of something evil that somebody who claims to represent God has done, or the other issue they've got with God is that he's smarter than them, and he's more powerful than them. And what it means, what, what does it mean if God's greater than us? It means we bow down. That's what it means. It means, it means he's worthy of worship. It means that God can tell us how to live and what to do. And how many of us like to be told what to do and how to live? How do you want pastor to come over and tell you how you should run your house? And tell you how you should do your job? Nobody likes to be told what to do. Why is that? Is it because we can't learn anything and that there's nothing that we could possibly be taught? Because we just know it all? Or is it because we're just prideful and we don't like to obey? The truth is the reason that you don't like God being greater than you are. If God's eternal and you had a beginning, what does it mean? If God is a creator and he made you, what does it mean? Well, it means that he's greater than us, and it means he's smarter than us. Listen, as smart as you are or as dumb as you are, God made you that way, which means he's far greater than you are. And that kind of rankles our pride a little bit. How many of you like to feel like you're the dumb person on the, in, the, in the situation? Where, none of us do, don't we? You know, I don't know about you, but I better not share too much personal here. But nobody likes to not think they're smart, right? Everybody wants to think that they're, and tell, even if they're dumb, they want to think that they're the smartest dumb person. You know, <laughs> I'm serious, I've met those people. So, anyway, verse, let's don't get off again. All right, now, here's the response. When they knew God, they glorified him not God, neither were thankful. Now, you have uh, two responses, really, to Jesus. God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for the righteousness of Christ. I want to be saved. Or, God, I don't need Jesus. And, you know what? That's your own problem that he died for my sin. I won't accept it. I don't want him. And so there's an attitude that says, I don't need it. I'm good enough, God. If you want me to go to heaven, you're going to have to accept me like I am. God wants you to go to heaven. He wants you to go so much that he had Jesus die on the cross for your sin. But friend, if you want to go to heaven, you're going to have to do it God's way, not your way. You're not God. He's greater than you. And the Bible says, became vain in their imaginations. In other words, they lifted up themselves, puffed themselves up in their mind, and became God. I, I, this is increasingly popular, this whole idea of humanism or the worship of the human intellect worship of yourself, and the humanist philosophy can be summarized many different ways, but the real summary is, I'm God. You know, we really are God. I mean, God is nature from it. Um, if you're in danger of something, being saved means you've been rescued or delivered from that danger. And the danger that every individual in the world is in is, is the matter of judgment from God. And you say, Pastor, I don't like that terminology. Well, um, Judgment's a reality whether we like it or not. Sin's a reality whether we like it or not. Your conscience tells you so. I don't. Uh, how do you know something's wrong? How do you know something's right or wrong? Murder. Wantonly taking innocent life. How do you know that it's wrong? Well, your conscience itself tells you that. And so it's a witness to the fact that there is right and wrong. And right is righteousness, and it's characterized or patterned after the righteous, holy nature of God. Wrong, the Bible refers to as sin. And it's amazing, isn't it, that we really judge God about this matter and say that people shouldn't say things are right and shouldn't say things are wrong. You let somebody wrong you and see what your opinion about that is. Sin is against God, and he says it's wrong. 
It's offensive to him personally. It's against him personally. And the fact of the matter is that we're born sinners. It's natural for us to make ourselves the enemies of God. Nobody had to train you in sin, did they? Uh, I don't know about you, and uh, I, I'll be honest with you, it, it's possible that you may have had parents like this, but I didn't. My parents didn't sit me down and teach me how to sin. And you didn't either, did you? Uh, I uh, saw something that was posted uh, the other day by a, a friend of mine on the Internet, and they said something to the effect of they had a saying or a statement that they would say, and they said it, and then their child repeated it, a three-year-old child repeated it, and their response was, that sounded terrible coming from a three-year-old, and a three-year-old shouldn't say what I just said, and so then if a three-year-old shouldn't say it, then that person's response was, I probably shouldn't say it either. And it's amazing how when somebody else does the same thing that you do, particularly your children, you recognize that it's wrong. Well, this is a matter of a conscience, isn't it? Hey, how many of you want a foul mouth three-year-old? Somebody cursing, and this wasn't something foul, it was just something that was like, you know, I didn't really think I was that bad, but when I heard my three-year-old say it, I just thought, man, three-year-old shouldn't say that, and so I shouldn't either. And there's some application there, isn't there? Uh, it, it's, isn't it amazing that we have ratings for things, like child rating and adult rating? And I would just submit to you, if it's bad for a kid, it's bad for you too. And uh, it's bad because it's sin. And so the reason we're talking about bad is because that's our way of using the terminology, but the Bible calls it sin. And the problem with sin is that it's against God. God hates it. It hates him. And it's an attack against his holy nature. Sin is against God. Well, go to Romans chapter 1. And we'll, uh, we start in chapter 16. Just look back just a little bit, and we'll go over a review of the book of Romans. The first thing that the book of Romans teaches regarding our salvation is that everybody in the world needs Jesus. Everyone in the world needs to be saved. And there are a lot of questions that people have about that. And the question is, what about people that don't come from a uh, quote-unquote Christian worldview or background? They've never been exposed to Christianity. And, the, and Romans chapter 1 answers that question very plainly. Uh, first of all, it says in uh, verse 16 of Romans 1, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. Power here is a word that indicates supernatural ability. And the gospel is the good news about the fact that you and I are born in sin, but Jesus Christ became or died for our sin, and that if we ask God to save us because of the substitutionary work, in other words, substitution was this. Jesus had our sin placed on him. And when we ask God to save us, we have the righteousness of Jesus placed on us. So if you ask God to save you because of the work of Jesus on the cross, he took the penalty and the punishment for sin, and we have the privilege simply by asking God to save us of taking the righteousness of Jesus and having that put on us. And isn't it amazing that God could look at you and I and see us as being absolutely without sin? That is indeed the reality of the fact of the way that God sees believers in Jesus, people who have been saved or delivered from judgment for their sin. And so uh, I want to mention something else regarding judgment. I started to talk about it just a minute ago, and I said, you know, a lot of people don't like the word judgment. Why does God get the right to judge me? And do you know what the answer to that question is that I've been impressed about from the book of Romans? He has the right to judge you because he judged himself. In other words, here's Jesus, the perfect son of God who never sinned, who lived on this earth with the temptations that you and I had, who surrendered his power as God. Can God be killed? No. Can God be limited like a man? And the answer is no. And Jesus, when he had his earthly ministry on earth, surrendered his power as God, and worked in the same power that you and I are capable of having, the power of his Holy Spirit, and lived a whole life and never sinned. And then voluntarily gave up his right to live. He died and for in the substitution for our sin. And so when he died on the cross, he was dead for three days because of sin, and he was resurrected after three days, walked on this earth for over 40 days, was seen of thousands of individuals, and the resurrected Christ, and then with the, the disciples of Jesus, uh, over, uh, over uh, there's literally hundreds of them, watched him ascend up into heaven. Now, that's a historical fact. Now, Jesus became sin for us, the substitution. Now, and, and the question was, why does God have the right to judge me because of my sin? In other words, I'm bad, I'm a sinner, and I just don't, you know, I just think God ought to just forgive me, or he ought to ignore my sin. Why does he get the right to judge me? 
And I'll tell you something. It's the right to judge you, first of all, because you can be sinless because of Jesus. In other words, a person has the opportunity to have the righteousness of Jesus and rejects it, deserves judgment. Isn't that true? If you're, if you're given a chance to be righteous and you don't receive it, do you deserve judgment? And the answer is yes. You didn't have to. And so you deserve the consequences. Secondly, he has the right to judge sin because he judged himself. You ever have somebody ask you to do something they wouldn't do themselves? It's not really fair, is it, when somebody says, would you do this? You think, the only reason you're asking me to do that is because you won't do it. <laughs> How do you like being the underdog at work? The employee that is the guy that uh, everybody else has higher rank than. So they'll ask you to do something, but they wouldn't do it. So why don't you do it? Hey, no way I'd do that. Uh, you ever been dared to do something? A dare is always something that somebody wouldn't do themselves and tries to get you to do. Remember that when you're dared to do something. person daring you, if they thought it were possible or they thought it were a good idea, they'd do it themselves and they wouldn't ask you to it. But now when somebody else has done something already themselves and it's either been good for them or it has, has accomplished the desired purpose of it, it's not a bad thing for them to ask you to do it, is it? You know, God, because sin is against him, has the right to judge sin. But he's not asking you, or he's not doing something to you that he hasn't done to himself. He judged his righteous son. And I don't know if you can imagine with me having a child who's never sinned, who's always pleased you, who's always done good, being, having their good substituted for the most vile, wicked, evil in the world. And God did that to Jesus. He judged Jesus. And I just want to say, you've got no right to judge God about judgment. You have no right to tell God Almighty that he doesn't have the right to judge. By the way, whether that's your opinion or not, he will judge. The Bible says there's going to come a time when every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to fast Jesus Christ to the glory of God the Father. And let's make this more personal, if you will. If you don't mind this morning, I think it will be helpful to us. Uh, you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, what about all the people that, that have never heard about Jesus? Is God going to judge them? Before we ever answer that question, which the Bible does answer in Romans chapter 1 and 2, how about answering the question for yourself? Have you ever heard about Jesus? In other words, that's not you. And so first of all, it's none of your business. Your business is you know about Jesus, and you know about what God has done in the person of Jesus, and you don't fit in that category anyway. So you telling God that he doesn't have the right to judge you because you've never heard doesn't apply, does it? And so let's deal with the matter on a personal level. Beginning, Okay, Romans chapter 1 and Romans chapter 2, God gives a universal call to repentance. What is repentance? Repentance is simply uh, not just a change of mind. It is, it is a change of attitude in the, in the context of our salvation. Is a, a repentance is turning from a choice of unbelief to a choice of belief. Now, we, I said a choice of unbelief. Do you know that anyone who believes does so by faith? It's true. You know, a person that says to a Christian, they say, you know what? Everything a Christian has to accept, they have to accept by faith. That's true. That's true. You say, Pastor, really? There's no evidence that Jesus died on the cross? There's no evidence that he's the Son of God? There's all kind of evidence for those things, but the bottom line is that when you make the choice to believe or not to believe, it's faith. It's faith. At some point, you have to accept that it's true and that the alternative truth is untrue, if you will. Now, you can do so. You can accept truth based upon facts, but the fact is, uh, and a little pun there, but the fact is, is that at a certain point, you're just going to have to believe. And that a person who doesn't believe does so by faith. It takes faith not to believe, just as much as it takes faith to believe. And I want to say to you, Christian, that it's more than just your refusing to be right with God. It is your deciding to be subservient to sin instead of God. You'd rather have your sin and its destructive effects on you. You'd rather serve the devil who hates you and wants to destroy you than live for holy God. Atheism is one of the silliest things in the world, if you know anything about Israel. I mean, the fact that two million people lived in the wilderness for 40 years, it's not possible. There's no food and there's no water. Go check it out. And yet, for 40 years, God provided Many of us believe a lie about God, and that is that he's not the God of all living. But if you study the scripture, what you'll find out is that God is the God of all men. 
God is the judge of all men. All men will stand before God and they'll be judged by God for what they do with Christ. And that's true. It's always been true. He's the God of the just and he's the God of the unjust. He's the God of the believer. He's the God of the unbeliever. And you can't change that by believing or not believing in God. He's God. Friend, I want to say to you that God's desire is not to judge mankind. God's desire is to redeem all men to Himself. And He proved that in the person of His Son, Jesus. But you know, in spite of that truth, many men have the attitude of, well, if that's who God is, I don't want to know Him. If God, that's who God is, it's impossible to please Him. If that's who God is, then I'll never serve Him. This is not the God we want. God's revealed Himself to us in His Word, and He is who He says He is, not who we say He is. Many of us have defined God ourselves. Well, my God's a God of love. He, he's not a God of judgment. My friend, you don't understand love until you understand the fact that God judged His own Son in the place of us. And if anyone has the right to judge, isn't it the person who has taken the sins of the whole world on Himself? I just don't believe that God would send people to hell. Friend, Jesus became the enemy of God because of our sin. You think that rejecting Jesus doesn't give God the right to send you to hell? God's a just and a holy judge. And you can believe what you want about Him, but that's not the truth. And what the truth is, is who God is. I want to tell you this morning that living for God is the most wonderful thing that could ever happen to you. That serving Him brings a joy and a peace and a contentment and a fulfillment that there's no substitute for. I'm telling you, even if that weren't true, you still need to bow. You say, well, God better be a good God if I'm going to serve Him. My friend, He's God. You need to just stop trying to make Him serve you. We preach this God that we're so careful about to make Him palatable, acceptable to people. Jesus said, if they're offended of me, they're going to be offended at you. Well, when you, pre you need to quit preaching about hell so much and about judgment and tell people about the love of God. There isn't a single person in the world that didn't get saved because of judgment. I, no saved person. I'm telling you, just be real about it. When you got saved, you got saved because you needed to. Right? That's a fact. You'd have gone to hell without the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And you didn't know anything about the love of God until you battled. And you can tell people about a loving God and they don't know about love until they bow. Jude said, some of them, fire, fire. We need to tell people about fire. Friend, you may not like God. You may have a problem with who He is, but I'm telling you something, He is who He is. And unless you bow now, you'll never stand. Judgment is the truth, friend. Judgment will come. Whether you let God be God for you or not, He is. God's made it so easy for us to bow to Him and to know Him. God knew that the truth about us is that we are His natural born enemies. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And if you're honest about it, you know that you're not the exception to that. There's no good person. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. I'm a sinner. Because I'm a sinner, my sin is against holy God. And I'll be judged for it. And so will you. Friend, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Death means separation. It means you can't have a right relationship with God when there's sin between you. You're the enemy of God as long as there's sin between you and Him. So the Bible says we're separated from God because of our sin. That separation it's an eternal separation when you go to the grave and you haven't believed in Jesus. But the Bible says the gift of God's eternal life. God's made it so that it's not necessary for you to be judged for your sin. And the way that He did it was He judged His Son, Jesus. The Bible says not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. When Jesus died on the cross, my friend, there was physical suffering, but the physical suffering isn't what saved us. Any man could suffer. But what Jesus did on the cross was He became my sin. And it became your sin. And God judged Him for the things that you and I have done. And the Bible says that the gift of eternal life is for whosoever. 
Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. God judged Jesus for your sin. But He didn't save you just because He judged Jesus. You see, my friend, if you don't receive the gift of God, which is Christ becoming sin for you, and His righteousness being credited to you, then you'll never bow. And if you never bow, my friend, you'll have to bow at judgment when God gives you the penalty for your sin because you weren't willing to accept the payment in the person of Jesus Christ. So if you want to be saved this morning, here's how. The Bible says, For by grace he is saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God. Our salvation is a free gift, and it's offered to anybody. You, you can't do righteous works. I know people who say, Pastor, I, I want to get saved, but I'm not going to right now. I need to straighten up my life so I can be a better person. And then I'll ask God to save me because then I'll be the kind of person He'd want to save. My friend, God doesn't save that kind of people. He saves people that are sinners. He didn't save perfect people. You can't get rid of your sin. That's, that's a lie from the devil. But He'll save you in spite of your sin because Jesus became that sin. And if you just call on the name of the Lord and say, God, I want to be saved because of what Jesus did when He died on the cross for my sins, was buried and rose again. God, not only do I want my sins to be dead, to be crucified with Jesus, but God, I want the life that's in Jesus Christ. I'm asking you to save me. The Bible says God will do it. He won't do it because you've changed, because you've become a good person. He'll do it because you bowed. And He said, I want Jesus. And I know people that say, Pastor, I, I, I believe that God is God, but I don't like Jesus. I think it's wrong that you have this exclusive Jesus thing. My friend, Jesus is the only one that was able to pay the penalty for your sin. Without Jesus, you cannot come to God. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. God loves you. Jesus loves you. And the Holy Spirit loves you. He's the one that convinces you of the truth of the Scripture and loves you to God. Man loves to worship idols. And I'll tell you why. Because idols are subject to man instead of man being subject to God. They didn't want to know God. They didn't want a relationship with God. And so what they wanted was the judgment to go away and God to go away as well. They said, we don't want that kind of a God. <laughs> we want one we can put up. We want one that we can move around. We don't want the kind of God that, that judges us. We want the kind of God that we judge. A Christian does the same thing when he says, well, my God would, or my God is. I heard Christians define their God and tell God what he's allowed to be and what he's allowed to do and judge him all the time. I've met Christians who will take what the Bible says. Well, I know the Bible says that, but I just don't believe that God... Go ahead and set your God up, but I'm telling you someday He'll be torn down. The Bible says there will be many people saying, Lord, Lord. And God's going to say to them, Depart from me, I never knew you. You can believe everything the Bible says about Jesus, but the Bible says the devils believe and tremble. They want God's power. They want God's authority. But they do not want to be subservient to God. They want to be able to carry Him about and to give Him marching orders for them. He's one that you can tell what He's allowed to do and what he's not allowed to do. God, this is, this is the area of my life. You can have this. God, you get Sunday. And Lord, you can have these hours during this time. But God, this is something in my life that I'm not willing to depart with. I'm not going to give it up. You can't have that. You say, well, I mean, God wants, God wants everything. He, he wants to change me. I can't, I can't be who I am. with My friend, that's the wonderful thing about God. Is that because of Jesus Christ, you don't have to be who you are. See, you, who you and I are is God's natural born enemy. And because of God, we're able to have the righteousness of Christ. And we're able to be free, free from sin. sin.